So it's great to be here. Uh, such a remarkable event. Um, I spent, as Chuck said, quite a lot, lot of my life uh, here in the States, but I never made it to Iowa City. Finally, I get to uh, remedy that. Uh, but what I'm really here to do is to challenge you to think differently about healthcare and about healthcare reform and about the future. So um, it's a meltdown. That's the first thing I want to say to you, is we are facing a meltdown, not actually just this one, serious though it is, of the ice cap. Um, not this one, which uh, many of you will recognize as a nuclear meltdown, nor even this one, which is the financial meltdown. Uh, I can't help being uh, slightly distracted by this one because this is now playing out, as you probably have heard, over Europe. So we have meltdown in Italy and the contagion. Uh, of course, what's happened here is that the debt that used to be owed by the banks is now owed by the governments, and nobody now believes that the governments can make, pay back the debt. So what we've done is move the debt around. We haven't actually solved the meltdown problem. But the meltdown that I want to talk about is about global health care. Uh, you look at this couple, I, I, I would call them Harry and Louise. I don't know if any of you are old enough to, to remember those two uh, folks from the Clinton times. But they're saying, really, over crying out loud, we can't deal with another one of these. So what's happening? Health spending is accelerating. It's taking a larger and larger share of GDP, not just here in the States, which of course is the most health spending nation in the world, but also almost everywhere else. Now, in one way that's good, but in another way it is, to use the word that's come up many times today, unsustainable. And so that's what I've been thinking and writing about over the last couple of years. What's happening is we're getting new technologies. Those new technologies are fantastic, but they're expensive. They often don't even replace previous technologies, they add to them. But the real issues are these, rising demands. So we're getting older, we're inflicting diseases upon ourselves, and we've heard some of that earlier today. Uh, and our expectations of what healthcare can give us have risen and risen. My parents' generation didn't have the expectations of living healthily into 60s, 70s, and 80s that we all have now. And we just cannot sustain that, the way in which we deliver care today. So we're going to get accelerated costs, and unless we tackle this problem, we will not be able to satisfy ourselves in old age, but even more importantly, the generations that follow. So how could things be better? Here is the good news, and when I put this slide up, you will not think it's good news, but this is the good news. Two-thirds of hospital admissions are avoidable. Two-thirds. When people get into hospital, the facts say more than half are not receiving the care that's recommended for the disease that they were admitted for. 10% of the time, what doctors do is what's called defensive medicine. You probably all know what this is. These are things doctors do that they don't think we need, but they do to avoid lawsuits. And there's about 17 billion per annum in the US cost of medical error. 40% of the time, on average, the medicines we receive are not the right ones for us. Now, that's not deliberate, but we're learning how to target medicines better. And, of course, on top of this, 15% of spending is unproductive administration, shuffling paper, shuffling money around. So when I said this is good news, these are all things we can do something about. So, my question, whose responsibility is it to do something about this? Well, of course, the president, usually the buck stops there. And that's what we've seen in the last few years, actually not just here in the States, but we've had healthcare reform driven top down in the United Kingdom as well. Congress, is Congress the place we should look? If we don't trust what a particular president comes forward with, will Congress solve the problem? What about your health plan? Are they working on this problem? Are they going to create a sustainable future for you? Or maybe the doctor, and of course the doctor is the figure we trust the most, but actually the power they have to make these changes is pretty limited. So the idea I'm here to share with you is actually looking for top-down health reform is the wrong place to look. 
I want you in your minds to turn this thing upside down and say, my responsibility is to solve this problem for me, for my family, for those I care about. And let's have health care reform, yes, but one person at a time. Me first. So my argument is that many of the things that I talked about before, which are failures and efficiency problems in the health system, we can do something about. The most obvious one are those diseases, those conditions that take us into hospital where we didn't need to go. The two-thirds of hospital admissions which are avoidable. Diseases that, if caught early, actually change the whole course of our lives. But that's also true of many of the other factors here. And the good news is that technology is beginning to give us the tools to deal with this. It's at the beginning, but there's some very ex exciting examples. Firstly, on prediction of what it is we might suffer from um, because of our genes uh, and our lifestyle. Secondly, the ability to be able to prevent disease or delay disease in the earlier stages. The pathways of disease and disease management that we need to know where we sit on. And piloting ourselves through, if we're unsuccessful in predicting, preventing, how do we pilot ourselves through the experience of healthcare so that we are, in fact, an efficient consumer of healthcare, not just a passive patient? So let's start with how we predict risk. We all know that over the last 10 years, we've learned a great deal about the human genome. We've sequenced it. But we've also begun to understand that the way in which genes and our behavior lead to disease is a very complex matter. The analogy I like to use is if you have songs on your iPod um, and they play through, that's the kind of model you have of the genes giving rise to your own uh, personal physiology. But actually, there's a very complex interplay between what you do with yourself, your lifestyle, what you eat, how you exercise, and those genes. We call it epigenetics. You can even pass that on to the next generation. So don't think of your genes as some fixed thing which gives you an absolute determination for your future life. You can do a lot about how those genes are expressed, what order those songs are played in, how many of one uh, gene is expressed at any one time. Here is what we knew about the links between our genes and disease in the year 2005. This is what we know now. In five years, we have established linkages between our genes and human disease, right the way across the genome, right the way across the types of diseases that we're, we're subject to. Let me take just one example, which is diabetes. Diabetes costs the US economy $200 billion a year. It affects 26 million people. But there are some particular kinds of diabetes that really illustrate what I'm trying to tell you. So the yellow area is type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes. The black area is typical type 1 diabetes, which affects people often in the first few years of their life. But I want to tell you a little bit about just this one type of diabetes called neonatal diabetes, which affects people right from the beginning of life. Here is a lady called Lily Jaffe with her mother. She is being treated, or has been treated, by Lou Phillipson at the University of Chicago. This has been quite an interesting story, because the particular gene mutation that she has in KCNJ11 is such that we found out that she can actually produce all the insulin she needs. It just can't get out of the cell. And so therefore, what you can do is treat that form of diabetes with a simple um, oral um, medicine, and you can give up all of those insulin injections, which otherwise she would have had to take. Now, here's where the story gets really interesting. This is the Lundfeldt family, and this is Cameron Lundfeldt in the middle. Now, they live in Alaska, and the last time I was in Alaska, it didn't look like that. The reason the backdrop of that family is Chicago is that Mrs. Lundfeldt got on the web. And when she realized that Cameron was really falling behind in his development, they thought he had autism, in fact, she said, hey, um, let's get him tested. 
and his gene was sequenced. And they found that the KCNJ11 mutation that Lily Jaffe had also affected Cameron Lundfeld. And so she sent an email to Dr. Philipson at Chicago. In 30 minutes, he called her back and said, send me all the test results, let's see what we can do. And so what actually happened was uh, he and his family flew down to Chicago and over a period of about five days were weaned off insulin injections three times a day, blood tests five times a day for a simple oral medicine. So this is, a, in a sense, a very heartwarming story. It's also a simple story because the genes in this particular case create the disease in a very direct way. Normally, as I say, in adult onset diabetes, it's a combination between the genes that you inherit and the behavior that you exhibit. So let's move from prediction to prevention. If you give this guy your blood and he measures seven particular markers in your bloodstream, he can give you, a test, a, a give you an assessment of your likelihood of developing diabetes. It happens to be a guy who used to work for me some years ago. He's, a very, he's as nice as he kind of looks in this picture. Um, and he has a little company in San Francisco, which hopefully will become a very big company in San Francisco. But as a result of running those tests on your blood, he can give you a green, amber, red readout. Now, here's the startling statistic, or one of them. One in three Americans are at risk of diabetes, will fall not in the green area, but in the orange or the red area. So a test like this that says, hey, we're on a process, we're in pre-diabetes, rather than diabetes, could have really important impact. My third P is pathways. This is a complicated picture. This is the treatment of diabetes in a particular part of the UK. But what I'm really trying to say is, you need to find out if disease develops where you sit on your own personal pathway. And you need to ask questions like, not just what's going to happen to me next, but tell me again why this particular medicine is the right one for me. Because of this alarming statistic that 40% of the medicines that people are given are not quite right for the disease that they have. And the reason is that actually the diseases as we define them are defined in terms of symptoms rather than in terms of the molecular pathology, what's going on inside the cell. And so we need to get a lot better at targeting how medicines um, uh, interact with our own particular physiology. The other thing that's happening is that we're moving where you receive your personal care, very often out of the somewhat impersonal uh, home of the hospital into the, the clinic, the community clinic, or even uh, over time into the home. And this actually enables us to make the care a much more personal thing and integrate it better into our lives. The next resource I want to share with you is that we, it's it, the, the uh, internet is giving us the ability to be able to relate to patients like us. Many of you will have heard this. this is actually a very good TED talk on patients like me because the guy who uh, founded it, founded it because of a health problem that his brother had. But wherever you are in your own journey, wherever you are in your own pathway of care, you can connect through a resource like this over the web to people who have that disease, and you can compare and contrast the medicines they're receiving, the care they're receiving, with what you're receiving in your life. Because actually your motivation is much stronger than the motivation of anybody else in the healthcare system. There are experts of all kinds in medicine, but the person who's most expert on you is you. But this is a resource you can use to compare what's happening in your life with what's happening in the lives of others. The next resource, of course, is this one, which is uh, we now have approximately one billion people with smartphones. Most people, who in this room has one? I can't see all the hands, but it's pretty much everybody. And on these um, smartphones, we can get applications, individual applications, this is just one of them, that can bring together the various aspects of our health lives. Now, if you buy one of these books that says applications for the iPhone or applications for the iPad, they run now to thousands in healthcare. What we need to be able to do is to bring together 
understanding of disease, understanding of medication, understanding its side effects, dosage administration, prescribing information, and your integrated care plan. So over time, we need to be able to put on these devices what previously we had in this form. Um, this happens to be a report from my doctor, a handwritten note that I can't actually read um, that said something about me, I think, if, if I put it to a handwriting expert. Here are all my lab results. I've also got um, a, a scan for something. I've got a DVD of the inside of my knee. I have a Weight Watchers chart. Now, of course, this is all showing that I'm taking initiative to, to, to look after myself. But it doesn't actually come together in the way that we'll be able to with these kinds of tools over time. The question is, what's the motivation to do this? This is hard work, right? Well, here's part of the motivation. The cost of healthcare to us as individuals, particularly if you live here in the States, and you have to pay the premiums and look at the deductibles. But there's a very interesting um, video on the web by a guy called Brian Pink that I read the other day, or I, I listened to the other day. Money actually isn't a great motivator with anything that's complex. It's the ability to self-determine your life, to develop mastery over something, what, what, what might be more interesting than mastery over your own health, and a sense of purpose to create sustainability in healthcare. There's plenty of local support. These are all um, activities that Iowa State or around here in Iowa. So I'm not suggesting that everything you do will be without any support. But what I am suggesting is that we need a movement. Not this kind of movement, which is, let's occupy the, the university hospital. That's probably not going to work. It's more a movement like this, so that we each learn how we, take, uh, how we take responsibility for our care, how we integrate all these exciting new tools, all this exciting new knowledge into the way in which we manage our lives. So taking up the tools for personal prediction, for personal prevention, for personal pathways, uh, and personal piloting. Using this technology, experimenting with this technology, and demanding that these tools drive the way in which we manage our lives. A good friend of mine says, OK, ideas sometimes drive technology, but technology often drives ideas. These are some of the things as we integrate them into our lives. We'll figure out new ways of managing ourselves. So what I want to leave you with is to avoid the medical meltdown that I'm worried about. We need a movement for sustainable health care. You might prefer to call it health care reform one person at a time. Now, you're probably expecting that I've come with the answer to this and how this movement is to be launched. I want to give you that challenge because you're the one who has the highest um, responsibility for your life, the strongest motivation for doing something about it. The challenge I want to leave you with is how do we launch a movement for sustainable health care? Thank you very much.